Adriana says, very happy and excited. I hope this is good for her, that the fans aren't pressuring her. I just rewatch and rewatch. Funny you say that. Um, I actually had a DM come through, I think maybe on Thursday or Friday, that was asking me, hey, are you going live this weekend? Want to plan ahead? And I was like, I don't... Definitely not Saturday, because I had grandma, farm school, and a friend's birthday after farm school today. So I was like, eh, probably not Saturday, but maybe Sunday. Um, and it turns out, I wanted to go live today. So, this is why I don't schedule lives, y'all. I just don't really know when I want to go live, and I want to keep it organic for myself. So, you may ask me for a schedule, and I may even give you one, because I may think that I know what I want but I actually don't know what I want most of the time. Man, I don't think I'm alone in that. So anyway, welcome to Saturday night. I don't feel pressured to go live, but I do feel like once a week is a good cadence to touch base with y'all on so that nobody is, you know, wondering if I'm dead, but I'm not dead. Usually I post a lot of shit on Instagram. Happy that you're here. We're gonna go through a couple of, um, Different things. I have to make Yotel Dover Lalao. We ran out today. I might not have enough flour, so we'll just have to wing it. I want to show you some things that I thrifted today. I want to show you some books that I got for free at Remix Market, which is where I thrifted the pot, which I intend on using on the stovetop. And y'all can do some detective work for me. It's corning ware. I think it's like vintage corning ware. Apparently, there's lead in vintage Pyrex and corning ware. I was not a aware of that until I googled it today but anyway all in due time one thing at a time I'm going to drink some stuff I'm going to make the dough and then we will proceed to other things welcome aboard happy Saturday night hope you're having a good start to your weekend um, and uh, I have not purchased the plunger why buy a plunger when you can use an oatmeal canister and if you don't know what I'm talking about you definitely do not follow me on Instagram your loss or blessing, however you want to look at that. Fiesta wear is also lead filled. Wonderful. You know, at this point, I am turning 34 this year. I figured I'm at the halfway mark of my life. I was thinking this week to myself and to some friends that I think 67 is a good way to end my life. And I'm 33 and a half ish, a little past 33 and a half ish right now. And so if I die at 67, it will mean that I will live another batch of what I've already lived and I feel like I've already lived through a lot and I really can't imagine what more I can do with more than a hundred percent of what I've already lived. Does that make sense to anybody else? I think about life in that way. I'm sure we'll always get hungry for more life when it comes closer to 67. I'm sure I'm no exception to that general drive towards living but I figured if I start making some life decisions now that will put me at that expiration date, more or less, I won't have a choice but to die at around that age, given that I don't die in some accidental freak incident. Um, so, yeah. <laughs> Yo tell do. Hey. If you want to live longer, by all means. I'm just talking about me. I'm not imposing my own sense of longevity onto you. I'm simply telling you what's going on through my mind as someone who's in her mid-30s. So, you know. Um, <laughs> Have y'all had an okay week so far? I haven't really... I guess chatted with anybody for almost a week now. Um, let me expand my chat window 
so that I can see you with my granny vision. Blow it up to 500%. 200%, 200%. Okay, cool. It has been a really long month. We're only halfway through. Um, so, you know, get ready. Oh, I wanted to show you this. I'm going to drink on this. I went to farm school today and, uh, you know, different folks brought in different tinctures and I call them potions, but they're just really different kinds of teas with different herbal elements in it. I think this one has like, I forgot the plant name. Is it marshmallow? Something that reminds me of marshmallow. It's not marshmallow the candy, it's an herb. But um, I'm gonna pour this over some ice and drink it. It is supposed to be really soothing for the lungs, which um, the student brought in because they were considering the fact that we had really smoky um, air from the Canadian fires. And I actually think there's a bit of haze rolling over again the city. Um, so this is supposed to be a little bit healing and cleansing for our air passageways. <laughs> Apparently, it's hot as balls in Beijing right now. I'm talking to my uncle and he's like, it is impossible to be indoors with the AC on. Um, they're experiencing close to 40 degrees Celsius temperatures, which is like desert weather. It's kind of horrifying. Um, and it is even more horrifying considering the fact that at mid-June, we're still getting kind of just spring weather, albeit it's a little bit more humid than what spring weather is usually like. But it's terrifying to me because I feel like in previous years in New York, by this time in June, we should be hitting consistently in the mid to high 80s, and we're still hovering in like the high 60s, high 70s, sometimes tipping over into the low 80s. It just feels weird. Um, I did break in one pair of boots. I actually started buying a lot more Birkenstock shoes after I bought that pair of boots, none of which are that expensive. All of the pairs that I bought fluctuate between 60 bucks and 90 bucks. Um, mostly because my feet, my knees, my hip have been really suffering and I think I just need new shoes. All the shoes that I've been wearing have been worn since before the pandemic so I just felt like it was time for a refresher and honestly I've been going through a little bit of like a capitalistic splurge therapy recently. I've been buying a lot of eBay jewelry such as this dangly earring and this earring um, and I've been buying a lot of shoes I've also been buying a lot of pistachios um, but I don't know guys I think it's just me feeling like what mom was saying to me um, in the few years before she passed away is like money is not money until it's spent and I've, I've been thinking about the ways in which my mom saved and penny pinched her way into like this very uncomfortable existence where she wouldn't even turn on heating for the winter in her house and she would be wearing winter coats in the house and I just wanted to get myself into the habit that I think mom always wanted me to get into which is to spend money and to buy things that are comfortable for my body are healing for my injuries and bring me some sort of joy in this you know I live in a comfortable hellscape other people live in less comfortable hellscapes. But whatever it is, I think we're all living in some variation of hellscape right now. And so, you know, I guess if you can afford it, use the money while you can. Um, so, that's all. That's my spiel. I will say, unfortunately, all the new pairs of Birkenstocks that I bought are nowhere near as comfortable as they used to be, probably because Birkenstock was acquired by the Louis Vuitton group during the pandemic uh, in 2021, I think. So 
everything across the board, quality has dropped. Um, uh, what you gonna do? It is still one of the better options for me in terms of feet space, toe space, but. All right, yo tail dough, two and a quarter cups of all purpose flour is about 290 grams. Oh, I have enough flour. Huzzah. Okay. And I think a large part of me feels guilty for buying things because it like makes plain to me, I guess, the relative privilege I have over some folks who can't just like randomly buy shit that they want. But also, I think that's a prison of my own making as well. There's always someone who's doing worse than you and there's always someone who's doing better than you. And so comparing yourself and judging yourself and limiting yourself and guilting yourself and shaming yourself is a never ending cycle that sometimes I just need to like take a fucking break from. guilt come from y'all where does all this guilt come from I don't know maybe it comes from the fact that I see so many people in New York City who are homeless and look like they're not having a great time existing and I feel helpless and I feel like maybe I should be giving away stuff that I have that I don't need to them, money, and I don't because um, I'm selfish and that triggers guilt in me, but also the feeling of like I can just keep giving all my money away to other people because there's endless amounts of people that need it more than I do. Has anybody ever read Simone Vey? Her last name is spelled W-E-I-L. I read Simone Vey in college. That shit affected me a lot. Um, she was a writer who I think in modern lenses suffered a lot from a form of anorexia. In her mind, she was suffering with soldiers who were suffering at the time. And she basically went on a hunger strike. Um, it ties into her philosophy of how she goes through so much existential pain because she wants so much to be in the presence of God who is invisible and unapparent in her life. Um, so abstracted and intangible that she doesn't know whether or not God actually exists and she wants him so badly to exist but ultimately spoiler alert through her philosophy she basically convinced herself that the absence of God and the pain of living without God and the pain of wanting God to be here so much in itself proved the existence of God because how can one miss something or someone that doesn't exist? So in her mind, God existed because she needed him so much and wanted him so much that the need for something must come from an existing thing. Um, but anyway, her life was basically wasted away with her solidarity with soldiers by starvation because she wanted to suffer alongside them as long as they were suffering because she felt like, I guess she didn't deserve to be better off than they were. And at the time, reading her life story made me feel really sad. I think I connected with her philosophy a lot, but I ultimately felt like, especially in the years that 
preceded me graduating from college and thinking through all these things continuously, I felt like a lot of her stance was misguided. Um, and I don't want to be her. <laughs> I really don't want to be the homegirl who starved herself to death. Not literally starving herself, like, through no intake of food, but starving herself existentially because she felt like she didn't deserve to live because other people were suffering and that she should be suffering with them too. I don't know if that does anything for anyone. And ultimately, I've convinced myself, which, you know, is just as biased as how she convinced herself of shit, that her, her, her suffering in solidarity was a selfish act. Like, ultimately, all of our acts are selfish, even though they may appear to be altruistic, I think ultimately we make our decisions based on how they make us feel, first and foremost, ultimately. Um, and, uh, at, at this stage in my life, you know, I'm just not for the, the self-denial, and I'm really not game to, to do that, so... That's my spiel. That's my first spiel of the night. I was talking with my uncle about, you know, the kind of legal corruption that exists. And he was, tell he was telling me that basically what I was describing about America, especially specific to New York City, under the the mayoral governance of Eric Adams also is reflected in Chinese society too, you know, um, legal corruption, by which I mean we pay into city, state, federal taxes, and all of these taxes get distributed into projects and departments that the people who pay taxes don't have a say in. Primarily in New York City, the amount of money that goes into policing um, versus the amount of money that goes into social services and education. The amount of money that get collected through federal tax that get put into military services that is termed defense, but is actually just creating chaos, violence, war, and crime abroad and domestic. Um, and, you know, it's just, uh, it's legal corruption is what it is. That's the term. Um, let me start mixing this dough and I will start reading your comments. So let me finish this one thing first. Did my mom also struggle with guilt? Probably. I feel like it comes naturally to Asian women in particular, but probably a lot of women to begin with. Um, but you know, hey, all right, I'm scrolling up, 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 up. Up. Okay, now I'm scrolling down, 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 down. You injured your knees and the slides help a lot. That's great. Love to hear it. Nothing but rain here for weeks now. Yeah, China, Ch Beijing right now has no rain. They're hot. They're hot. There's no rain. It's like a fucking desert. Um, we can't always be good. Yes, yes. Did you have a Bowser making video? Uh, I have a... I have a Bowser Delish recipe. I actually don't remember if I made a video for that. I might not have made a hosted video for that, but I do have a recipe up, so there's that, I guess. Um, there's a wealth movement in San Francisco Bay Area sharing their generational wealth to random people. That's kind of cool. Although, Okay, yes, better than nothing, although I do feel like that falls under philanthropy, which, you know, in our current capitalistic system, philanthropy is probably better than nothing, but philanthropy also falls into the rhythm of supporting capitalism because you still have people who have power who can then distribute that power how they please rather than kind of leveling everyone from a systemic point of view, but hey, there's only so much we can do in this hellscape, so... Um, <sighs> so we're going to make some yotel dough. 
Grandma has been, I think I told you this, yeah? Grandma has been placed on antidepressants. Her behavior, I think, has been a lot more even keeled, although I do feel like she still has kind of um, trouble distinguishing between dream states and reality. She sometimes will say things like, there are visitors at night that they won't let me see, or that, you know, people opened up my closet and stole, stole my clothes from me. Um, you know, stuff that we've heard before. But I feel like her temper has gotten a lot more even keeled, um, which I'm grateful for. So that's my grandma update. I do feel like I was talking with uncle about what he's been observing about grandma, and he does say that grandma seems a lot more enervated. She doesn't seem as energetic as before, which I don't know if that's the antidepressants doing that or if she's just getting old. Um, in January, she will turn 95. I told uncle there's a, from my point of view, there's a 70% chance that grandma's gonna hit 100. Um, and I told him that I've basically submitted myself to not being able to really travel or be independent of grandma until I'm past 40 years old, which in the beginning, I think I was just saying that to myself to kind of manage expectations and to kind of dull the hurt by saying, I'm gonna mentally prepare myself for this to happen um, just in case it happens. But now that I've been taking care of grandma for over a year and a half, I do feel like more and more that will just be my reality. So I'm growing used to it. I'm growing used to my lack of routine in life too. I'm trying to not guilt myself into not having structure, like a nine to five, like I feel like people expect themselves to have. I still feel a yearning to be structured in that way because I think society tells us we do a good job when we have that kind of nine to five structure, you know, be a cog be a good cog with with regimen, but I also feel like 65 to 85% of me, depending on the day, know for sure that I, for one, probably won't be able to find an employer who is going to be able to tolerate my views, and I don't really know if I can tamper down my views anymore um, for a full-time job like that, and I kind of really enjoy the the freedom to just spend time with grandma in the mornings without feeling like, oh fuck, I need to rush back and start my desk job. Um, to be able to take time in the evenings to make shit like this for her without feeling like, fuck, I've worked a whole day and now I'm exhausted and now I have to do that. Um, to not have to only look forward to the weekends, to have time to meet up with friends on their schedule, because we all know it's really hard to Make time for friends when you're an adult, huh? So. really weird incidents in the past two weeks where strangers will pass by where me and grandma stand for her sunbathing in the mornings and they're in, on both occasions they're men and they're like really weird men who does this thing where they just stand there and stare at grandma and they're like wondering I guess what she's doing there because she's old and in a wheelchair and then I'll be talking with my uncle about 20 feet away and I'll see these strange people staring at grandma so I'll walk over and I'll be like I'm taking care of her don't worry and then they'll start questioning me like who are you are you her caretaker and I'm like no I'm her granddaughter I take care of her we go on walks in the morning and then they'll ask about like is she in long-term care the man today approached me and he started being like, are you her caretaker? And I'm like, yes. And then he started talking to me in a very heavily accident, accident, ax, accent, accented way. God, my brain. And I, I was like, I'm sorry, I can't understand. 
And it turns out he was asking me, do you need a caretaker? And I'm like, no, I'm, I'm her caretaker. And he kept going on and on about like how he can take care of her. And I'm like, no, like, I don't even know you. And then I just said, I just said, no, thank you. No, no, no. And I said it several times and he wouldn't stop talking. So I walked away. By the way, I'm still with my uncle on Skype on this call. So I like walk away and I start telling my uncle that it's really annoying when strange men does this to me and grandma. And I walk away 20 feet in the other direction with grandma in between me and this man. And this man like stares at me for the next four minutes. And I notice him staring at me. So I stare at him back and I try to like give him some death glares, but he doesn't look away. And I'm just like, what do you want from me? And I'm bitching to my uncle about how these people fucking piss me off and won't leave me alone. And then my uncle was like, I think you should take grandma elsewhere. And right as he said that, the man finally turned around and walked away. I'm just like, dude. Yeah. I need to work on my death glare. I think I, I think my game is off, off the mark. Um, but so I might have to switch up the spot where I'm taking grandma because I'm getting all these weird interactions like this woman came up to me the other day and she reached through I'm standing outside someone's house right like I'm standing with grandma on a public street but it's a house line street and this woman comes up to me and she's talking to me about mint and I'm like what are you talking about and so she reaches her hand through someone's front yard like ironworks and she plucks some mint from the ground. And I'm like, oh, okay, you're plucking mint. And she was like, yeah. And I thought that this was her house and that she was telling me that she's growing mint and that she was offering me mint. And she was like, yeah, you can make tea with this. And I'm like, oh, that's cool. Um, I don't really want any. And she was like, can I take some? And I'm like, why are you asking me? It's not my house. And at this point, she's already plucked it in her hand. And I finally understand that she thought I was the owner of the house and that she was asking me for permission to pluck the mint. And I was like, well, I'm not the owner of the house, so unfortunately I cannot give you permission. And she was just like, well, I'm just taking a little. And I'm like, okay, but it's not my house, so you don't have to explain this to me. <sighs> Guys, <laughs> the mornings have been getting weird. Well, Rachel, I think it's pretty in line with my general parasocial dynamics that yes, strangers feel like they can open up to me and engage with me, including people who like to trauma dump on me about their family dynamics, about their suicidal ideation, about their suicidal attempts, about their relationships, about their parental relationships, about being lonely. I mean, listen, I guess you can DM me, but I am not a therapist. In my mind, I would like to be a therapist, but I'm also not getting paid to respond to DMs. So, you know, keep that in mind. Hi, Ness. Long time no see, friend. We have made the dough. I am going to let it rest and I am going to turn it a couple of times before I go to sleep tonight to strengthen the gluten network. And this will turn into donuts for grandma in the morning. Um, this is, this is what the dough looks and sounds like. Um,
Thanks, Ram. Yes, everybody listen to Ram. You can like, subscribe, or unsubscribe too. You can you you can't dislike now because YouTube I think took away that option. I don't know why, but they did. So you can't do that anymore. Take it up with YouTube. I don't care what you do. As long as you are happy, you do whatever you want, girl. I need to know where I put the lid to this. Did you guys see it? Oh, here it is. Thank you for your help. How do you differentiate love from obsession? Duration, I guess. I think all love probably starts with some form and degree of obsession, but does the obsession fizzle out? Does the veneer and the gilded impression of the person that you love fade away? I think that's key to understanding what's going on there. I'm going to take out some leftovers that I'll eat later. But first, what I want to show you is I have been yearning for Nutella for months now. I went to my friend Giannis's tonight and I saw Nutella in his cupboard. And I was like, bro, why do you have two containers of Nutella? And he was like, do you want it? It's expired. October 3rd, 2022. I was like, that's not bad. This shit is just, first ingredient is sugar. It's never gonna go bad. And he was like, well, I'm gonna throw it away. Do you want it? And uh, now I have it. Second things I wanna show you are these free books that I got. You get a sneak peek. Two of them are for me and two of them are for Aaron. This is one that I got for Aaron. A World Lit Only by Fire, The Medieval Mind, and The Renaissance, Portrait of an Age by William Manchester. What a name, right? Perfect name. Would you like to hear the back of it? I'm going to read it to you anyway, no matter what you say. Manchester provides easy access to a fascinating age when our modern mentality was just being born by the Chicago Tribune. All right, the summary goes... From tales of chivalrous knights to the barbarity of trial by ordeal, no era has been a greater source of awe, horror, and wonder than the Middle Ages. In handsomely crafted prose and with the grace and authority of his extraordinary gift for narrative history, William Manchester leads us from a civilization tottering on the brink of collapse to the grandeur of its rebirth the dense explosion of energy that spawned some of history's greatest poets, philosophers, painters, adventurers, and reformers, as well as some of its most spectacular villains, the Renaissance. Lively and engaging, full of exquisite details and anecdotes that transform this period, usually murky, into a comprehensive tableau, a review by Dallas Morning News. In case you were wondering who the author is, William Manchester is Professor of History Emeritus at Wesleyan University, Middletown, Connecticut. His previous 17 books, which have been translated into 18 languages and Braille, include Death of a President, The Arms of Krupp, American Caesar, and Goodbye Darkness. Do you want to listen to an excerpt? Um, let's see. Let's see. <laughs> the Vatican, with its population of bastards, was in no position to censure a advocate of infidelity. Marguerite's only real threat to Catholicism was her subsequent role as an accomplice of its enemies. Of its enemies? She later provided sanctuary for fugitives from Harrisim whoa, I don't know that word at all. Harrisimak possess? That doesn't even sound like English. One of them was John Kelvin. Okay, this book is very boring to me. I do not like history, but here's a picture. Fun. We like pictures. Um, let's see. Does it ever get fun? Probably not. I'm not a history girl, sorry. Ooh, a receipt. We love a receipt. Um Fordham Prep, E. Fordham Avenue in the Bronx. This is dated June 4th, 1997. Whoa, I just came to America that year. It was $17 when this book was bought. Holy shit, that's a lot of money for 1997. 
Um, hope it was good. Ooh, look, kind of naked lady. Ew. No, thank you. Everyone also knew and every child was taught that the air all around them was infested with invisible soulless spirits, some benign, but most of them evil, dangerous, long lived and hard to kill. That among them were the souls of unbaptized infants, ghouls who snuffled out cadavers in graveyards and chewed their bones, water nymphs skilled at luring knights to death by drowning, drakes who carried little children off to their caves beneath the earth, wolfmen, the undead, turned into ravenous beasts, and vampires, and vampires who rose from their tombs at dusk to suck the blood of men, women, or children who had strayed from home. At any moment, under any circumstances, a person could be removed from the world of the senses to a realm of magical creatures and occult powers. Every natural object possessed supernatural qualities, books interrupting dreams. Oh, sorry, books interpreting dreams were highly popular. The stars were known to be guided by angels and physicians were constantly consulting astrologers and theologians. Doctors diagnosing illnesses were influenced by the constellation under which the patient had been born or taken sick. This is great. So in the Middle Ages, doctors diagnose you based on your horoscopes? I guess the more things change, the more they stay the same. Thus, the eminent surgeon Guy de Choliac wrote, if anyone is wounded in the neck when the moon is at Taurus, the affliction will be dangerous. Y'all, do not get wounded in the neck during the month of May. Thus we have a world lit only by fire. Okay, so that's book one. There is a new season of Black Mirror? I didn't even know that. And this was a surprise book. Um, Goya, paintings, drawings, and prints. So, uh, Aaron really likes the paintings of Goya, and I just happened to find this in the free cart. So, we can take a, a little looky do, huh? Francisco Goya, paintings, drawings, and prints. Selected and introduced by Philip Troutman. This is a self portrait from 1797. This is a very long introduction that I will not read to you. I will read maybe three sentences. His hand was weaker and his eyesight failing, but he was active to the end. On 16 April 1828, shortly after his 82nd birthday, the great Spanish painter died in exile. Uh, this is the free cart from Remix Market in Long Island City. Look! Look at this cute Maria Teresa de Bourbon y Villabriga, 1783. Goya lived through a time of social crisis and his art, which was infinitely responsive to the constantly changing social atmosphere, was concerned exclusively with the portrayal of the individual in society. It was only after a long struggle that he finally arrived at his own painting. The development of his painting to around 1791 depended on a gradual deviation from the styles he had early mastered, the Baroque, Rococo, and Neoclassical, as he introduced some new conception of form, rhythm, and painting of his own. With the outbreak of war in 1808, Goya's painting underwent a further dramatic change. His color lost something of his splendor and became heavier and more powerful, and the handling of his brush became even more spontaneous and energetic. The new genre he introduced at this time of laborers engaged in their various activities is distinct from that of the pictures of manual workers which were to become popular in the 19th century and which no doubt owed something to Goya. During and after the war, most of Goya's energies were spent on paintings made for his own satisfaction or for his friends. The so-called black paintings with which he decorated the walls of his country house in the years 1820 to 1822 constitute the most tremendous monument to his imaginative genius. 
There is no distortion, but Goya's painting and design knew how to give the scene the tremendous proportions of its reality and human implications. Do you see the human implications? Hmm? Hmm? Um, here we have the Annunciation, 1785, oil on canvas. Here we have the Osuna family, 1788. They look like um, they are a little bit scary and maybe dead inside. Here we have the mannequin, El Pelele, 1791 to two. Um, it's a little bit freaky, not gonna lie. He looks like a dead guy, like a corpse being flung by women who might or might not have killed him. This reminds me of that um, Sofia Coppola movie with fucking Nicole Kidman and a bunch of other girls who taken Colin Farrell, the Civil War soldier. Does anybody know what I'm talking about? What is the name of that movie? Um, they all like were lustful and starved for male attention and touch and they all kind of like were ravenous for his, for his romantic relationship. And uh, spoiler alert, something bad happens to him. The Beguiled. Thank you. Thank you, Leonore. Um, here we have Pickaback. Las Gigantillas. I don't know what's happening here, but I guess they're giants. The Madhouse at Saragossa. Quite mad. Quite scary. Would not want to be this guy. This guy, I would not want to be near this guy either. He is going to haunt my dreams tonight. I hope I don't have one. This guy looks like he is fed up with women wanting to dig his gold. This is Francisco Bayou y Subias, 1795. Um, this lady is the Duchess of Alba. She has a cute little mutt. A okay, nice hair, nice bow, nice dress. Corset is a little bit tight. I'm not sure she can breathe, but you know, she's doing it. Good for her. Here we have the clothes Maha, La Maha Vestida. 1805, I don't know what a Maha is, but she looks like she's entered her slut era. You go, girl. And she's definitely entered her slut era here. The unclothed Maha, La Maha Desnuda, 1805. Are we enjoying this storybook time? I'm enjoying it. I'll never see this book again, I guess. Um, Doña Isabel Cobos de Porcel, 1805. She looks classy, huh? Got a little bit of plumpness about her. Definitely donning a little bit of like funeral attire, but it's got some sleekness and Revelations of the chest and cleavage, a little bit, you know, sexy, but widowy sexy. Um, they sued the painter and forced him to paint clothes over. Okay, interesting. This is a knife grinder, 1810. I feel like he should not be looking at the painter and paying attention to the knife that is in his hand being ground down. I'm uh, really scared for his hands but you know 1810 he either survived or he didn't and he either kept his hands or he didn't so we'll never know here we have a lot of naked men um who might or might not have been stranded on an island and have lost their mind slowly there is a vaguely pale colored leg here that might or not be attached to the rest of a body. I'm not sure if they're eating someone here or they're just, I think they're eating someone. I think he's holding someone's hand. Okay, scene of savages, 1810, there we have it. Followed by still life, plucked turkey, 1810. Uh, this is a plucked turkey and this is a plucked turkey. We just, it's a whole plucked scene going on this page here. Next page, the letter, la carta. 1812 um she's reading a letter she's got this like really smug look on her face like my lady i have come to bear the news to you that indeed the assassination on your husband's mistress has been complete and she is as dead as she will ever be i hope you are happy and i await my pay 
That's definitely what's happening here. Look at that face. She definitely planned out someone's murder. Next, the 2nd of May. There you have it. That's what happened on the 2nd of May in 1814, I guess. Um, and then we have the 3rd of May. There's, there's a lot of uh, guns and uh, dead bodies. So, um, okay, next, self-portrait. This is the man who has been drawing all of these scenes. Say hi. What up? And next we have duel with clubs. We got a little bit of like Cain and Abel, but clothed action here. They look like they're brothers who definitely slept with the same girl and they're trying to fight to the death because they hate being the loser, but actually they're both losers because look at the positioning. Both of them are gonna get whacked in the head and the neck. None of them are gonna win. And the plot twist, girl likes neither one of them because they're losers. Next. Witches Sabbath. Um, definitely some creepy shit going on here. I'm not going to look at that one for too long. And then we have the Pilgrimage of St. Isidore, 1820. They also look like skellies facing the rapture of a dark, gloomy cloud. Maybe they're going through some Canadian fire clouds, too. Um, so, drawings. The 700 or so drawings by Goya which probably represent only a fraction of his enormous output fall into two categories to the first belong those made as preparatory to paintings and engravings of which the former employ a whole variety of techniques and range in type from the study of some detail or the rapid note of some pictorial idea to a more finished composite compositional study blah 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 the bulk of these paintings are lost blah 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 um, to the second category belong the drawings he made as independent works of art in their own right. The majority of these appear to have been made in numbered series, and it is clear from the gaps in the enumeration that many of these drawings are also lost to us. Okay, so my dude did not really maintain his um, images well. Kind of sounds like me. Recently had a memory card with totally corrupt footage on it. I don't back up any of my footage. I hate myself sometimes but you know great artists we don't care about keeping track of our art we just want to output shit so anyway here we go here's uh maho smoking i don't know who maho is but he's smoking cool we can all aspire to be him here is maho clapping his hands and that's awesome we love a man who likes to clap his hands um and here's maha fainting the swoon some somebody's somebody's either in ecstasy or drank a little too much. A okay. Um, this girl, I don't know. She's smiling way too much with that rope in her hand. I don't know what she's planning on doing with that rope, but she's definitely thinking of doing something with that rope. Um, this is the three washer women of only one who is faced. The other two are like ghouls in the background. Cool. NPC? These are NPC? Yeah? Cool. Um, the Duchess of Alba, 1796. She looks like she's having a really bad hair day and possibly a migraine. Definitely blaming it on the corset. That shit is like just... It's torture. We got to get her out of there. We might be a little bit too late, like 240 years too late, but you know. Look at her. Don't do this to yourself, ladies. You're beautiful just as you are. Um, this is young woman with arms outstretched, morning greeting. We don't know what Satan she is praising here, but she's definitely praying to some kind of pagan god. Um, she's got her booty popping out at a certain angle, so she's pretty aware that somebody is watching her and painting her. She's making sure that her assets are well represented. Yes? Cool. This is the original Instagram thought, just three centuries too early. Um, and, uh, um... I don't know. I feel like I could draw this. Maybe if I tried really hard. Young woman mirrored as a serpent. That's cool. Um, I'm not sure how Goya feels about women, but based off of this, 
probably not great thoughts about women. But you know, women are like food. If you think you don't like a food, you probably just haven't tried the, the better versions of that thing yet, you know? So if you hate women, maybe think about what women you've been in the company with. Or maybe we are just all snakes. That's fine too. Um, the water carrier. She looks okay. Like normal-ish. Uh, she's got two jugs and they don't look very heavy. And she looks like she's not all there. So she might be a little bit high or she's just posing to make it look effortless so that, you know, men think that she would be good wifey material. I think she's good wifey material, good, good definition and volume to her curls, really nice rounded face, nice little structure. You can see she's got a little bit of a tummy, but probably because she's not suffocating herself with a corset. So this woman knows how to respect herself. Role model. Next, three men digging. Are they digging or are they burying? It looks like they're really going hard at it. It looks like they're trying to get this job done before somebody else comes upon them. What are they trying to hide? Find out on the next season of, oops, Goya lost all his drawings. Man, woman, child, and dog walking in a landscape. There's a dog. Uh, there's the woman? I'm not sure where the man is, but I'm guessing that's the child. I kind of see like half man, half horse that's been butchered and bundled. So maybe she's eating the man for dinner. That's a diet. Um, the real, the, the Duke of Wellington, 18... 12, he looks fine. He looks a little bit anxious. He looks like maybe he just lost the love of his life and he's a little bit scared that he's gonna die alone, but like, buddy, don't worry. We're all gonna die alone. You just got there a little bit sooner than you wanted to. Truth beset by dark spirits, 1815. So I'm guessing the woman in white is Truth and she's shining, shining, and all of these dark spirits are, I don't know, trying to get skeevy with her. So this, this is Goya's interpretation of fake news, but what we actually have come to realize is that she is just a figment of our imagination. Truth is not beset by dark spirits. Truth is actually a dark spirit herself. I think once they start getting skeevy with her and attacking her, she'll take off her mask and reveal herself to be even scarier than they are. Plot twist. We'll also never know this, but uh, I support my theory because there's puddles of darkness underneath her dress. It matches the darkness of these shadows and spirits behind her. I don't know why she would be kind of producing this shadowy seepage if she were not also a dark spirit. Another way of bullfighting on foot. Study for plate two of the Toro Maquia. There we go. Really nice drawing. Really cute bull. But I do believe they are stabbing him to death because bullfighting. It does not end well for the bulls. I... <sighs> Rest in peace, bull. For being of generous spirit. She's got a look on her face that's a little bit like uh, the head that Medusa just chopped off with the um, Christ figure nailed to the cross, kind of in the throes of agony and death. It looks like there's a chain around her neck. I don't really know what's going on here, but I don't like it. She looks kind of dead. Um, so I think the moral of the story is if you are a generous spirit, they will actually just chain you up and kill you. So don't be generous. You've been warned. Look at her. 
Do you wanna be her? No? Then don't fucking be a generous person. Next. Thus the useful end their days. Well, that's a little bit dark. Um, he's really depressing, isn't he? I don't know why Aaron likes Goya. A crowd in a park. We all look like ants. Holy Week in Spain and former times. They look like uh, the granddaddies of KKK. That's cool. Raving Madmen. Hey, finally, we get a title that matches what it depicts. Um, he could be a little bit more ravey, but you know, I can't complain about a dead artist's work. He's dead already. Here's a skater. I'm not sure what he's skating on, but they look cool. They look like little sled shoes. Um, he looks like he's having fun. Look at that little joyous mouth expression. He's got a funky little head covering on that's not quite a cap and not quite a hood. Um, I feel like the more I look at Goya, the more scared I get. So I'm just not gonna look at them for very long. New carriages or shoulder chairs. He could not decide what to call them, so he called them both. You choose, reader. About 300 of Goya's engraved plates are preserved, and they include almost the whole of his mature work in this field. By far, the greater number are accounted for by the various series, and almost all are in the technique of etching and aquatint, one of a number of techniques invented or perfected in the 18th century for the purpose, more especially of reproducing paintings. Goya, however, employed it as an artistic technique in its own right. Late in his career, he was to be one of the first great artists to take up the new technology of lithography. Blah, 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 blah. I'm a little tired, so I'm just gonna let the painting do the work, but I really like this one. Look at all these owls. And there's like a straight up owl cat here. Look at that face. What is she saying? She's definitely like, I'm sorry, did I give you permission to paint me, bitch? Um, the dream of reason produces monsters. Wow, that is a morality tale. The dream of reason produces monsters. <sighs> Goya is like the Aesop of paintings. That is what I have learned. Here we have the boogeyman is coming and a terrified child. And the mother looks like she's really happy to see him. And the children look both monstrous and scary. They look scarier than the boogeyman, actually, because I don't see the boogeyman. Maybe that's why the mom is happy. She's like, finally, please take these monsters away from me. Um, may God forgive her. And it was her mother. This is like a Spanish telenova. Look at that face. And it was her mother. Those specks of dust become a mountain of dirt. The story of how I did not do cleaning in my apartment and wound up being a hoarder saved me. Um, he broke the jug and now he's getting spanked on the butt. This guy has this kid's shirt nabbed in between his teeth. This guy is a little bit pervy. Um, so, you know, stay away from this man. He should be on a poster for pedals. Um, Goya was definitely on LSD of some sort when he drew this. This is Will the pupil be any wiser? And it is just donkeys. With no pen in his hoof, but somehow pointing at a book with four A's written on it. Um, drugs were consumed. Uh, you won't get away. Again, we have creatures chasing a beautiful woman. And she looks like she's liking the attention. Is this when rape culture started? Maybe, 1797. A very old art. 
Disaster number two, with or without cause. Disaster number three, the same. Disaster 15, there's nothing one can do. Okay, literally in every scene, people are just getting stabbed, chopped, or like rifled while tied to a beam. Disaster number 16, they take advantage from it. Okay, now they're just like ripping clothes off of dead bodies and scavenging, that's cool. Damn, Goya, you were traumatized. He really needed some therapy. Disaster 30, ravages of war. Self-explanatory, lots of bodies, lots of limbs, lots of chairs akimbo and broken houses. Disaster number 32, why? Indeed, why do we do this? Not sure, not sure. Disaster 34, because of a knife. Um, I'm not sure what's going on here. It looks like a lot of people are staring at this guy who is seated and it looks like he's using a dagger that looks like a cross and he's stabbing his crotch with it. And I'm not sure if he's alive. Goya is one of the most disturbing people ever, I'm learning. Disaster 45, remind me to ask Aaron why he likes Goya, please. And this I saw as well. I do not, know want, I do not want to know what they saw but it looks like there is a pig dog here. That's kind of cute. Disaster 50. Wow, these just don't end. Poor mother. Okay, it looks like mom has passed away and the kid is crying. And this man looks like he's way into carrying a dead body. Stay away from that man. Disaster 61. Are they of another race? Huh. Not sure. Everyone's just kind of dark and ghostly in these in these creations so they're definitely not of anyone i know disaster 70 they do not know the road finally we are done with disasters this one is titled the detention as barbarous as the crime okay lots of chains lots of ankle bracelets he doesn't look that bad but He's going to turn bad if he's kept in this state. That's how punishment works. If the criminal does not exist, you create them. Toro Maquia 21, the terrible events in the stands at Madrid. Um, it looks like there is a bull still standing and a lot of scared bodies being trampled. You go, girlfriend! Fight for your species. Rebel against the oppression and the abuse. This this might be my favorite. If I if I frame any one of these, I would choose this one. Hell yeah. Stack those human bodies up. The Colossus. The Colossus. Well. I like this one too, but I would not hang him up. He's still a little bit too terrifying for me, and there is no glory. Provo Proverbio 1. Feminine folly. The feminine folly always involves women with demented facial expressions and scandalous creepy smiles tossing bodies up in the air from a blanket. What the fuck is going on? Ay, ay, ay. Proverbio number two, folly of fear. Folly of fear. Uh, I'm not sure if it's folly or fear of folly, but we have a tree, it is dark. We have this ginormous hooded figure that I'm guessing is death with a lot of bodies that are already passed away and some who are frightened, but this guy looks like he's into it. He looks like he has met his maker. Um, and this guy is like, no, I shall fight you to the death, but I will also be turning my body away from you so I can run away as fast as possible because you are tall and big and death. Um, this is the everyman. This is all of us. This is all of us trying to fight against death while running away from death. We are all hilarious. This is, this is the folly of fear. 
We embody the fear, we recognize it, but we also deny it at the same time. We are all clowns. Yeah, how can a thin book have so many pictures? This is way too long. The Andalusian Dance, Alvito. I don't think anybody's dancing. I think there's always one central figure, usually a woman who's relatively shining in white palettes, surrounded by darker figures who seem like they're enjoying her company, but also might be planning something more scandalous. I don't like this dynamic. But you have to admit, compositionally, it is very cohesive and convincing. Mm. Group of women, one of which who has fainted yet again, and they're all just staring at her like, she's going like, do you think we want to revive this bitch? She was always kind of annoying, wasn't she? And they were like, yeah, but like, we should do the right thing, right? Like, she's, she's not doing great, like, we should feed her something. This girl's got bread in her hand. And then there's like this shadowy cloaked figure in the back. So I think she's ready to go to her maker, but they're like, maybe no, not yet. And she's like, come on guys, just let her go. We'll find her a substitute in our knitting club for Sundays. Um, modern duel, two people staring. One person really scared that he just stabbed this guy and this guy going, wow, you stabbed me, you jerk. I can't believe you did that, even though we both agreed to a duel. Idiots. Bullfight in a Divided Arena from the Bulls of Bordeaux series, 1824. There's a lot of people looking like pests. You know, they're just all termite -y. And there's a lot of space given around the bull. We are valorizing the bull. We are concentrating on this demented smile on the guy who is just poised to really kill this bull while the bull might be eating. Is that a plate of food or water for the bull? Like, that's a cowardly stance. Come on, bro. You can't kill a bull while it's eating. Um, and then here's another bull. And this guy looks like he's trying to sell him fake Rolexes. Fun. What a handsome dude. What a refreshing change of scenery. This is portrait of a young man, 1825 to seven. Took him three years to draw that. And the end, you made it through. Congratulations, that was Goya. Did you survive? I don't even know if I wanna read my other books, but here's Marks and Science. This is for me. This was published in 1952. Um, the contents are introductory, how Marx became a Marxist, philosophy and religion, journalism, politics and exile, Friedrich Engels, revolution and evolution, excuse me, philosophers must change the world. Oh, let's read that. Let's read page 20. I've lost a lot of you. Not all of you like reading to you that's not a bull that's actually tra the traditional hat of a bullfighter oh so the hat fell on the floor gotcha okay philosophers must change the world marx's crowning contribution was in the linking of thought with action this new dimension of philosophy came to him from the hegelian dialect dialectic restored to its material basis and from the direct experience of political struggle Marx used the Hegelian idiom very freely and with great mastery. Indeed, he was so steeped in Hegel's method of thought and expression that a good deal of his early work must appear much more obscure to us now than it did to his contemporaries. This reminds me of why I dropped out of the philosophy department in college. Why did I get it? I don't know, it's a cute book. And I've read two pages that were way less heady than that. Um, a Wild Swan and Other Tales by Michael Cunningham. I believe this is the same dude that wrote The Hours, which I never read, but I saw the movie starring Meryl Streep, Nicole Kidman, and Julianne Moore. It was the most melodramatic, depressing movie I had seen up to that point in my life. But the soundtrack was by Philip Glass and I love the soundtrack. That was the first movie that I saw where I was like, the soundtrack makes the movie. So, 
Yes, yes, yes. Here we have inside a newspaper clipping. Let's read this. Severely fractured. Reworked fairy tales offer back stories and physical imperfection. Oh, this is a newspaper clipping of the book, A Wild Swan and Other Tales by Michael Cunningham. Interesting. This person was really into this book, huh? They like read the review. Which came first, the review or the book purchase? No idea. The novelist Michael Cunningham's reimagined fairy tales in a wild swan, beautifully illustrated by Yuko Shimizu in a style that recalls Aubrey Beardsley with a touch of Maurice Sendek, are fractured in more ways than one. Cunningham has toyed with familiar stories before, subjecting Virginia Woolf's mental illness and her novel Mrs. Dalloway to brilliant theme and variation pyrotechnics in the hours. In his recent novel, The Snow Queen, Cunningham drew obliquely on the same Hans Christian Andersen story that inspired the Disney film Frozen while immersing himself in the rich corpus of classic fairy tales, the inspiration for his new book. I dug out beautiful caves behind my characters, Wolf wrote in the diary entry Cunningham used as an epigraph to the hours. I think that gives exactly what I want. Humanity, humor, death. Cunningham has performed a similar operation on the 10 tales he has selected for transformation. Okay. Why does this painting look like a Goya painting too? Weird. Weird. Goya is following me everywhere. I'm terrified. Terrified. Yes, this is the illustrated copy. I don't know why this was on the free cart. It's in relatively good condition. We have a bookmark from the Harvard, Har Harvard, Harvard Library in New York. Do you guys say library or library? I said library until middle school and then I was like, whoa, there are two R's in this word. I should pronounce both of them. I know, I know. I also said salmon for a very long time in my life. English makes no sense. These illustrations remind me of like tarot card illustrations. Whoa, that's a creepy one. Holy shit. Holy shit, the harp is playing itself. It's a harp woman. In chains. Oh, that is dark. Mm. Mm. Whoa. Whoa. Fun, 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 fun. Okay, that's it for my book show and tell. Are you still here? Um, I'm going to take a break and maybe eat something because it's almost 10. Corningware pot is coming up after the snack break. I need to eat. I would like a snack. So I got a $2 kabocha and I instant potted it and it kind of overcooked it, not gonna lie. Mm. You know how when you overcook vegetables, they take on that kind of cafeteria over steamed taste where it loses a little bit of natural sweetness and turns into like a slightly sour flavor field. It's not bad, but not great. I've learned my lesson that if you are 
steaming a whole cut up kombucha squash in the instant pot. Do not let it go for 23 minutes. That is way too long. Here is a pasta salad that I made with pasta, pickles, cauliflower, roasted carrots, spicy peppers, sweet corn, olives, and a lot of spices. So I'm gonna have some of that with my pumpkin because I made this shit a little bit too salty. So I kind of need a little bit of a plain buffer and the pumpkin will give me some vitamin A and fiber and D seasoning, okay? And I am going to eat it cold. I do not heat up pasta. These are macaroni pasta from Trader Joe's. I love the macaroni shape from Trader Joe's. I find them delightfully shell-like. They've got these wonderful ridges. Mmm. Ooh, the olives are really good with the kombucha. Nice. I'll show you the pot next. This is a dress that I got. It is a little bit, sorry, it's a skirt. It's a very long skirt. It's a little bit too big for me, but it was only $3. And it is 100% Lyocell, which is one of my favorite fabrics ever to touch. And it's made in the USA. Um, the the tags is Boston proper, and I've never heard of this brand before. So I think what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna um, cut open a slit here, and I'm gonna ask grandma to snake through an elastic so that we can cinch the waist in a little bit, and I can at least wear it at home, you know? It's very long. It's actually a little too long for me, I think. I'm not tall enough for it, but. It could be a cool dress if grandma can cinch it so that it sits right underneath my boobs and I could just wear like a bralette. That could be a cute look, but we'll have to see. This is quite a heavy skirt, so it might pull down a little bit, but I figured it was only three bucks and grandma could use some projects and I love the fabric. So even if all else fails, I can just like pet it. I was thinking about a tube dress actually. Could be cute. Although tube dresses are not very flattering on me because I don't have a lot of boobage. So it kind of just accentuates my belly, which extends out farther than my boobs do in a side profile. She could have straps, mm -hmm. but with what fabric? Ooh, add a belt. Yes. True. Very true. Boy. Ready to do some research for me? This is a $15 with a 25% off deal at Remix Market. This is a Corning Ware casserole pot. It says Corning Ware with like a star asterisk design on top. And then it says B-2.5-B. 
that is B dash two and a half dash B with a little flowery design in the middle here and on the other side of the flower it says two and a half quarts and then it says made in USA so if you want to do research this is a white bottom with a clear lid and the lid reads for Pyrex copyright or trademark or trademark trademark and then it says G1C so the lid reads for Pyrex G1C tell me what dirt you find on it It's easily broken? Oh no. I don't like easily broken things. Because I break things very easily. Give me a clean peel. Whew, okay. Good, good, good. I think what I'm going to do is just run this through the dishwasher, but I do want to give it like a little scrubby done before it goes in. I do plan on using it on the stove top, so if you have any dirt on um, whether or not this is actually stove top safe, you let me know. So with a 25% discount and tax included, I think this came to like $12.25 or $12.50, which I think is a good, good deal. And uh, I've just been collecting my pots, you know. I'm a pop girl now. Anya, when you say here around 50 USD, where are you? Where is here? 9 a.m. Good morning. I dare you to tell me how much water I'm using. Go ahead. Indonesia. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah, I did find that this was a good deal. Some thrift stores charge a shit ton for these vintage stuff. So every time I see something like this below 15 bucks, I'm like, let's just get it. 15 bucks doesn't even buy me an entree in a restaurant anymore. So if I can have something that I can use for a couple of times at least, it's worth it. tuning in if you'd like to stick around I will be snacking on stuff and also maybe giving you a heads up that tomorrow I plan on starting filming another long-form video obviously the last one took me like two months to finish over two months to finish 
but we're gonna start filming another long form video and um, planning to do the shopping for tomorrow. I'm also planning to meet up with Aaron tomorrow to do the shopping, so maybe he'll have a little cameo at the beginning of that video since y'all miss him so much. Mm. Jason's not here. Not here tonight. He's got better shit to do than all of his harem, so. We respect a husband who has a life outside the home. There's also mozzarella in the pasta salad. Mm -hmm. So that being said, I originally thought I might go live tomorrow, but if I'm gonna be shopping and filming it, I might not go live. So this may be it in terms of lives for the week. I hope you really enjoyed learning about Goya. Um, I did. Yes, if the Pyrex logo is in all caps, it is more vintage and vintage Pyrex used to use a more fortified glass that is less likely to suddenly crack. Can I take you thrifting again? It's a little hard because most of these days I don't really get out of the house as much as I used to because I kind of have a part-time job and I've been structuring Personally, my opinion is I've been structuring too much of my life around the part-time job. I'm trying to like negotiate with myself on how to finagle myself out of that rhythm so that I don't prioritize a part-time job as much as I have been. I think I've been using the part-time job as a way to escape my own aimlessness in life. So I think until I have a sort of goal for myself in place to be able to prioritize that over the part-time job, I'll probably keep prioritizing the part-time job. It's kind of like finding a new lover to get over your last lover. I kind of need a rebound of existential meaning. Um, I did hear about the makers of Pyrex and Instant Pot filing for bankruptcy. Aaron sent me that Instagram post that alerted me to that. Yeah, I don't know. I thought they were doing really well. Guess not. Guess nobody's cooking anymore after the pandemic. So when I do go thrifting, it's almost unplanned. So I don't have my camera with me because the camera is really big and unwieldy. And I often have to like pad my backpack to make sure I don't damage the camera because I don't want it dangling around on me. So, you know, if I don't have my camera on me, I can film with my phone, I guess, but it just wouldn't be the same. I oftentimes thrift when I'm coming home from an event and I'm like, okay, I have a few hours to burn. Do I want to, are there any thrift stores near me? Do I want to step into one? So it's very like by chance. If there's any imperfection, it can shatter. Mm. Well, yeah, my friend Giannis was like, I don't know about you using glass pots, it scares me. And I'm like, Russian roulette, right? Most of life is Russian roulette. You just gotta take a chance. So, I wouldn't say no to a full-time job, but I think it would have to be a very bespoke position for me with a company that isn't in direct conflict with my morals, which is most of them. So 
It's not impossible. But it's difficult. Anyway, that's it. I'm gonna keep snacking, but I'm gonna go sit down and watch some shows, but I enjoyed showing off my life to you. I hope you enjoyed it to some extent too. And hopefully I'll have a medium sized, medium length video for you by the end of this month. Hopefully, no promises. But it'll feature four restaurants that I've eaten at. One of which has all the corrupt footage, but I'm choosing to present it still because I think it's fun to show you how I can fuck up my life sometimes and still make something out of it. And I think some of the food shots in, in that is still pretty decent. So anyway, cool beans, take care of yourself, stay hydrated, sleep, rest, be good. Uh, buy something to make yourself happy because capitalism is still alive and well, and we can't escape it. So, you know.